Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here to speak today. Um, and as many of you know, I tend to be a very informal speaker. I did put together, um, oh, I pulled a whole bunch of new slides and put things in different order and added a whole bunch of stuff. And I have no idea how it's really going to play out in the amount of time I have. Because as you know, I go into digressions. Um, but, and I'm probably going to stand over here because that light's just too bright. And I am just getting over a cold, so I'm not really at my best. Oh. <laughs> so I'll move over here. Uh, <laughs> avoid the light. Um, hmm. Okay, well, so, and my topic is design. Um, and you all know I'm much more of a botany and horticulture person, although my background is design. Um, so I guess I'll just get into it. Usually I start with something like this. Uh, and this is just Antelope Valley in spring. Why so many people decide to get into California native plants or growing plants. And as I usually say with a slide like this, is go back in July and look at what's there. Absolutely nothing. It is decomposed granite uh, and just barren ground. And that's why horticulture and gardening is different. And uh, it was interesting that there was a different view of the same thing. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Um, that uh, these flower fields in Japan, uh, where again they become big touristy things, where where thousands of people come and visit them for that about two week or maybe three week period when it's at peak bloom, and then they move it to a different area that they have another annual or short lived perennial uh, to do those same sorts of giant displays. But again, it's nobody goes there the other 51 and a half weeks of the year. <laughs> and then you all know I'm a book person, and there's a brand new book out by a friend of mine, uh, one of my former employees at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, uh, Barbara Eisenstein, uh, who is our public horticulture person. Uh, and this is a book about her garden and her gardening experience. And actually, although she's from South Pasadena, uh, it was published by Heyday Press up here in Berkeley. Uh, I made that connection for both, both of them. Uh, and it just came out last month. Uh, and I think the, the paperback version is like 18 bucks. It seems very well designed. I have not had a chance to read it yet, but f flipping through it, I could tell it's a, going to be a very good book, and especially for people that are more beginners, um, and it, it should be a great introduction. And then many times I do talk about Garden Garden. Uh, this is a project in Santa Monica. Oh, and I see that that camera is just following me around. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Garden Garden is um, one of the only projects I'm aware of that uh, the city of Santa Monica funded. Uh, it's on Santa Monica Community College uh, property. And it's two gardens that are side by side. And you can, whoops, uh, you can see this is this, and this is that. So they are side by side. And you can also see that that one says police department. <laughs> and the other one is an environmental group. <laughs> uh, so very appropriately, law and order versus chaos. Um, and the, the great thing about this project is not only is it side by side, but they have recorded all of the data for it for years. And here's a summary of it and divide it out so that you can see what the, the cost per year of water, green waste, labor, et cetera. 
And again, um, it's amazing how much less water and um, green waste and maintenance costs. Uh, and again, that's city of Santa Monica. And that data, that project, a lot of it is online. If you go, it's hard to find, because if you type in Garden Garden, you'll get 10 million hits. Uh, but try Garden Garden Santa Monica, and you'll probably find it. And there's a lot of different places. Because again, you know, municipalities never make it easy to find things. But it's all there. The other thing that uh, I often talk about is our, our Mediterranean climate. It is the key to everything, horticulturally and biodiversity in California. And the California Floristic Province being the real heart of the Mediterranean climate portion of the state. Uh, this, was, this, this was a sign that I did the map for uh, while at Rancho Santa Ana. And it is a bit different from many of the others uh, in that um, our group decided that the Sierra and all of this part of the north really isn't hard Mediterranean climate. Um, if you go to the Sierra in the summer, what usually happens? Rain in the afternoon. Uh, so how can you have a Mediterranean climate with summer rain? Um, and in the north coast, the redwood forests, those are not a drought adapted system at all. Uh, but those are all transitional areas anyway. But so if you think about the rest of that part of the state and down into northern Baja, uh, that is really the, the heart of the Mediterranean climate in California. But there's never really been, well, and you can read the rest of that. Uh, but there's never really been kind of an enumeration of what that flora is, and now there is. Uh, this is a publication that Dylan Burge and I and a number of other people uh, put together. Uh, it's a special issue of Madronio that just came out this year, and it's basically the entire volume. But why I'm bringing it up for horticulture or is twofold. One is, as I said, it does have the full list of all of the taxa of the California Floristic Province. And there you can see at the tops, everybody's familiar with the Jepson Manual? Okay, well, and you know there are the maps, which you'll see in the next slide. But all of these things are the various abbreviations from the Jepson Manual plus Oregon, plus Baja, and plus whether it's endemic, only found within the California Floristic Province. Now, this is the California Floristic Province, mostly of Raven and Axelrod, not of my previous slide. And so there's that uh, Jepson map. And so the Jepson uh, people feel that this is kind of the line, and that that's CAFP, California Forestry Province. And again, since it's the state of California, it does indicate it goes down into Baja and up into Oregon, but not how far. And so this publication in Madronio has addressed all of that. And so if you're thinking of things about how local is local, how native is native, you can use that Madronio volume to say, okay, if you're in Central Western, what are all of the possibilities? And you can go down that list, and if there's an X, it's that found somewhere within that zone. So, and another thing that I oftentimes mention is a lot of people talk about Oh, if you're just gardening with native plants, it's so limiting. Uh, you know, there just aren't that many. Uh, but yes, there are about 6,000. If, if you include all of the Floristic Province, it goes up by about another 2,000. And then you have uh, over 13,000, or a total of over 13,000, because there are about 7,000 
cultivars out of that native flora. The average garden, the average garden, has about 50 different taxa in it. Uh, the average plants person garden has about 250 different plants in it, kinds. So having over 13,000, you should be able to have quite an interesting garden. <laughs> Now, the next group of slides that I have um, were more to talk about some elements of design. And just um, when you're talking about habitats and so on, again, if you're thinking back to those earlier slides about the floristic province and about uh, the different portions within it, and you think of the gross habitats within them, the different kinds of chaparrales, the different kinds of coastal sage scrubs, the different kinds of grasslands, and so on. There's just a myriad uh, variety of things to play off of in your gardens. Uh, at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden, and how many people have not been to the Regional Parks Botanic Garden in Tilden? Um, you should come. Uh, we're the free botanic garden. Uh, it's free parking and free admission. And we're open all but, what, four days of the year. And it's one of the older established California native plant gardens. There are just three in the entire state. Uh, there's ours, there's Santa Barbara, and Rancho Santa Ana. Um, Ours is the youngest, founded or dedicated in 1940. So we just had our 75th anniversary last year. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was just some sort of gross level design sorts of issues. And different people have talked about different aspects of layering plants, plant, nobody's really talked about individual plant texture, color, harmony, repetition, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'll just touch on some of that with some of these slides. But what I really wanted to show in this one is more, when we were talking just recently uh, with Frederic about the, uh, the idea of hedgerows and mixing things, there are many different kinds of things you can do effectively with hedges and hedgerows uh, or those sorts of effects. And if you think of them as sort of your background instead of a fence or a wall, although fences and walls are fine, I like walls, <laughs> uh, they're permanent uh, if, they're, if they're blocks or whatever. Um, and you don't have to worry about replacing them so often. But it gives you a, a uniform background to play off of. In our garden, we have a lot of different taxa in 10 acres. If you look at those Santa Lucia firs, you can see that the backdrop for all of these other things, really, you pick up that line very clearly because that's all conifers. You can see through this deciduous oak very clearly, uh, although it's spring and, and it's leafed out. And so the other thing I wanted to talk about, too, was, as I said, foliage texture. That's all calicanthus down there, which is a very coarse-leaved species. And you see how that looks nearer just because of that. And all of this stuff back here just sort of recedes and looks even further away because it's fine textured. You can pull all of these things together in your own home gardens as well. You know, if you put your coarse texture right up front and all the fine textured stuff in the back, it's going to make the space look bigger. If you reverse that, it's going to look smaller. Most people are trying to make their yards look bigger because most of us don't have lots of acreage. Um, I also wanted to just show some of the uh, recent things that we've been up to. This is a sort of a redo of our Southern California desert. And this 
the rock work was done by Phil Johnson, a very well-known uh, artisan contractor who works with large boulders. Um, and we pretty much took out everything other than we had two Joshua trees, one there, one over here, and right back there, the petrophytum, the little rock spirea uh, that we didn't want to move. Everything else got moved. It was surprising how much of it was relatively easily moved uh, and reestablished. That was the soil mix we used. A lot of people ask about that. It really doesn't matter so much, as much though as the bottom line. Percentage wise, it's 75% sort of rock, 18.75% um, sort of organics, and six, point, six and a quarter volcanics. So it's a very nutrient poor mix. I do have handouts for those of you who are interested in that. And it also has two, three of uh, three other references that I don't have in the talk otherwise. Two of them are for designing with plants, and I'll just mention them right now. Garden Design Illustrated by Grant and Grant, published in 1954, but recently republished. And for those of you who really like the idea of color, there really is nothing better than uh, Color Schemes for the Flower Garden by, by Gertrude Jekyll. And there are many different editions, but it's just more about color theory and looking at the types of flowers and how they work together. And then the other one for habitats or for specific wildlife it's a very obscure, older thing from 1939 called Native Woody Plants of the United States, Their Erosion Control and Wildlife Values by William R. Vandersal, and it was published by the USDA in 1939. It's all based on stomach records of birds and deer and all kinds of things. So. It's uh, not, I saw it fly into that shrub. It's that, yes, it was in that shrub, and yes, it was eating that shrub. Uh, and there's not a lot of easily accessible records like that, other than that book that I've, that I've really found and used a number of times. Um, it is for the whole US, but there are an awful lot of California natives in it. And then that was just uh, part of one of the areas that Phil did. Um, and that has now become Baja California native plants of the floristic province. Uh, and it ends up, I thought it was going to be really warm next to the building. It's a cold place in our garden. Um, one of the other just basic design things is spacing. Um, you all know that many designers like to put in lots of plants at the beginning and then you have to remove a whole bunch of them or they get too crowded and get too tall too quickly if they're ground covers. Anyway, the, the top image is how the place looked when we planted it and it was finished. This is like five years later. Again, it's perfectly fine to have lots of blank space. Uh, also, the, the issue about mulches, I totally agree. Normally, I don't use mulches myself in any of my home gardens. Um, and I usually do have a lot of bees and other uh, insects and lizards and so on using the ground. Um, at Rancho Santa Ana, for these desert cultivars, we were using the gravel mulches. Um, but in other areas, you can certainly use organics, although I'm generally not a big fan of them uh, because they tend to ch change the soil chemistry a lot. And it's not always beneficial um, unless you keep going. It's uh, 
uh, Dr. Orndorff of UC Berkeley had come to visit and do a review, outside review, of Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens living collection in the 1990s. And as we were driving around on the way back, he was saying, oh, you have mustards and the exotic nettles. Those are areas where there has been mulch in the past. And he was right. Um, it changed the soil chemistry such that it was much more adaptable for European weeds. The areas that we did not ever mulch, which were some of the desert collections in the back, had a lot of long-standing um, annual displays that would still come up in years when we had good rains. Centaurium venustum, uh, the, the native carrot, uh, all kinds of things that were still present in the soil seed bank that were not going to be there with mulches. Uh, layering, always a good idea. And again, I just have two images specifically on that that are just very easy and clear. You have lines, annuals, long-lived perennial, manzanita, pines. So um, just using all of your space that's available. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, you don't want to put all of your low stuff in back of these things because you'll never see them. Um, but again, it is more how you design your garden and how you experience your garden so that you can have rooms within the, within the space. And again, just the, the planting combinations themselves. Everyone tends to think of of designing with the flower colors in mind and that the flowers aren't there that long. So it's much more important to be looking at the characteristics of the foliage and just what the color values are. And that a lot of times how you should look at your garden design ideas is when you look at an image like that, just blur your eyes or narrow your eyes down and look at it. And you, what you see is one big blob, one other blob, and one other blob. And that that's when you do that with this, it's a lot different. I mean, you've got this shape, you've got this upright shape, you've got a spreading shape, another big spready shape and so on. It's just a lot more interesting to look at the pattern, growth pattern of the plant and the foliage color and size and texture. And when we are talking about habitat gardens, as has been mentioned before, water. Uh, whether it's just a bird bath, whether it's just a little pool or divot in a rock uh, for the butterflies to visit, uh, it will always bring in a lot more wildlife than if you have none. Uh, and most gardens do have some area that's wetter than the other, whether it's because your neighbor next door waters 24 hours a day, so you always have water along your property line, or you have a leaky pipe that no one's ever going to fix because it's under your foundation. Uh, whatever the reason is, everybody tends to have a little bit of a wet area. Uh, so just think of it as a benefit and plant accordingly. Uh, again, a lot of people will be thinking that, well, actually, let me put this another way entirely. Uh, when I arrived at Rancho Santa Ana, nobody had looked at the irrigation system for decades. And we had permanent wetland features out in the plant communities, which is on the, the alluvial part of the garden where water drainage is excellent. Without having planted, there was typha, there were willows, there were uh, the various uh, scarlet monkey flowers, there were all kinds of things just find the areas where they're adapted to, even though we didn't have those species in the garden itself. Um, and the, the nearest wetland area was about a mile away. 
and having ponds and pools. Uh, this is our pond that we're forbidden to go into by legal mandate, um, although we built it. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Um, we wanted to go in and clear out a lot of the algae and that yes, it's something that we all know, there are all kinds of frogs and newts and dragonfly larvae, all kinds of things in there. Um, and all we wanted to do was just get rid of some of this junk uh, to make it more usable for California's aquatic plants, and there are quite a few of them, uh, but we're considered part of the trails, creeks, and ponds of the East Bay Regional Park District and have to have permits in order to do these things. And the state and the other agencies have not been willing to give us any permits to do any of cleanup work. So, it's one of those things. So, yes, we do now have bullfrogs in there because we're not able to get in there and clean it out. But, it is, once you have water, you do have a whole other ecosystem that just comes. Um, we also have herons that come that then will go over into the lawn area, and it's amazing. They will come and get gophers and just, uh, and just pull them out of the ground and throw them up in the air, and down they go. <laughs> it's quite remarkable to watch. Um, having spent 24 years in Southern California, I certainly have an appreciation of dry gardens um, and dry land California plants. And again, if you look at this image and just kind of blur your eyes, you, you really don't pick up a whole lot of texture there because they're all fairly similar, other than the cactus, the choyas. Uh, and so it's more of what the hardscape and the paths do to give it more structure and design, and then using some repeated forms like the buckwheats uh, and some of the sages uh, to, to have those repeated sort of mounding forms. And yet some of these nolinas are actually also giving a lot of that part of the garden structure. Repeating forms, all of these uh, chamociparous, again dotted around in this one part of the clamosiscu part of the garden. Um, the other thing that I really did not, um, or I don't think I have a good photo of in here, that really gives our garden so much of its feel is the large masses of uh, quaking aspens uh, that are around the lawns. And that that really, again, gives a lot of structure and, and backdrop to much of the garden that you look out at. And again, if you're just looking at this, what immediately stands out is that. Uh, it's sort of out of place. <laughs> and yet, it's in the Southern California section of the garden, but again, uh, palms. Actually, I'll ask the group, how many palms are in the California Forest of Province? Wrong. <laughs> two, 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 and they're not that one. <laughs> Neither of them are that one. That one is from the desert. What are the two? The two you'll get. You'll see one of them in a minute, uh, and the other one you won't see is the Guadalupe Island fan palm, uh, Brahia edulis. Uh, and so yes, there are. Mediterranean climate palms in California or in the California floristic province in the Mediterranean climate portion of the state uh, and the region, uh, but both of them happen to be from Baja. Um, this again, it's more texture that I wanted you to look at in this 
and all of this, many people have visited the garden. What is that? Yeah, but which one? <laughs> our special ones. That's the Franciscan Manzanita, uh, Arctostaphylos Franciscana. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, but again, it's so fine textured that even in photos, it just kind of becomes a muddle. Uh, and what you are looking at then, again, are these strong verticals, both outside the garden and inside the garden, which are giving more structure. And you're seeing these other lines, which I don't even know what that is particularly from. We do, since we are all of the state and many parts of the state do get more water than we do locally. Um, this is our redwood forest section with the oxalis and the uh, lady ferns and giant chain fern. But again, if you look at that with, with blurred eyes again, what you're really seeing are the masses of ferns and then the, the strong col vertical columns and the fine texture in the foreground. And that's in our Pacific Rainforest part. And again, these areas in the Berkeley Hills really don't need that much extra water. Uh, and it really is one of those situations where I just don't see much structure. It's all just green. And again, this is actually one of my favorite views in the garden. Uh, looking down through the Franciscan section over toward the rainforest. And again, you're seeing the, the strong vertical elements of the conifers, the rounded shapes of many of the uh, deciduous trees over here, uh, and manzanitas in the foreground, and also ferns. And many of you should probably know exactly where this was taken. It's just very near here. Many of you know Betsy Klepsch? Oh, yeah. That's her garden. Uh, and again, under that oak is almost all native plants, except for the purple by the trunk, which is a European geranium species, uh, which again would go dry in the summer. Um, and uh, uh, pretty much what's there are California poppies, uh, strawberries, and miner's lettuce, and a few others. And that it's pretty much completely dry in the summer under the oak. And again, if you blur your eyes, it's more the color that you're really looking at in this, the, the gray foliage. Grays, grays are really good, or it's so nice that we have so many gray foliages to work with in California, because they kind of blend things together uh, and can unify a picture more. And then again, in the background, you see some eucharists, some irises, and venegazia. Venegazi is one of those plants you can really use anywhere. It can take dense, dense shade or full hot sun. It can be extremely long-lived or it can be very ephemeral. In Southern California, you usually see it after a fire, but then it's called canyon sunflower because it's usually in canyons that are shaded. Uh, the fire following phase is more atypical, although that's when you see millions of them. And the Dudley is just Dudley Ahaziae. Mass plantings are something that, again, most people in smaller gardens tend not to do them. Uh, most of us tend to do onesies, twosies, occasionally threes. Uh, but it really is masses of plants. And as was mentioned earlier, for in, I think it was the B talk about a meter square for a lot of annuals. So it's not just one, it's an area so that it reads visually and that you can really play with it more than just one individual, which 
if it dies, your system is, or your plans are foiled, uh, which they often are anyway. <laughs> but that's all just California fescue on a shady slope, kind of midsummer. And as my co-author Dave Frost always says, brown is a color too. Uh, and so there are many kinds of browns, uh, from chocolate browns, which Carol Bornstein always says, oh, it's a beautiful chocolate brown, and I enjoy it all year round. And it's, no, I enjoy it for a few months, and cut it off, uh, and let some new stuff come up. But again, it is more appreciating how the plants go through the season and how they go through time. Uh, many people think of gardening and horticulture as a static thing, and those of us who do it all the time know it's different every day, let alone five years ago and ten years into the future, and that that's part of the fun of it. It's you never really know exactly what's going to happen because Horticulture is like medicine. It's an art and a science. Uh, there, you can't just say, do this and you'll be successful. Uh, because my sense of maintenance, my sense of what low water use versus yours is probably entirely different. And my aesthetic as far as how wild looking can it get versus somebody else's is gonna be very different. And I also like Judas uh, publication. A plant is not a couch. <laughs> that, again, they grow, they change, they age, you move them along. Uh, although I'm surprised your backwards only get through two cutbacks. At Rancho we have some that have been cut back probably 50 times. Um, and there was one that came up at the School of Theology next door right on Foothill Boulevard that one of the gardeners had poodle-dogged it. Uh, and it was amazingly effective. And it was like this big, and there were just all these little blobs, just like you see olive trees done. And I never took a picture of it, and then one day the city came through and cut it off. <laughs> um, and, I, and I always regret I didn't take a picture of it because it really looked good. You can do a lot more with our plants than many people think as far as cutting and pruning. This is in my garden in Upland. Um, I could live with anything as far as aesthetics go. Um, and I did get one of those letters from the city <laughs> saying, our native plant experts say that gar native plant gardens don't need to look as bad as yours does. <laughs> and that they thought that I needed more maintenance. And, and I wrote them back saying, oh, I don't know who your native plant experts are, but perhaps they're familiar with my books. <laughs> and, I would be happy to help you uh, understand what I'm doing. Um, I never heard from them again, and I lived in the city for about 15 years. Anyway, this, this is one of my favorite native plants, a California sagebrush. It is coastal sage. Uh, and this was just a seedling that came up in my front yard. Uh, probably one year after I moved in. It was still there when I left. Uh, but this is what I would do to it periodically. Uh, cut it back very, very, very hard. Again, November 23rd. And then this is what it would look like in February. And when I'd be out front and people would see this, they'd go, ooh, what is that? And then, of course, when it was, when it was the previous one, oh, nobody asked me what that was. <laughs> but again, it's, uh, it just does show you how dramatically plants change within the course of one growing season. Uh, and I had more of them. 
Uh, that was some more that I cut back in the parkway. Those came up as seedlings off of the other one. And so, yeah, periodically, I would just do different things. Um, parkways are always fun. And then this was just to check and see if you're awake. <laughs> I was just appalled to see spray-painted plants for sale. Those are actually really a mammalaria cactus. There's our other fan palm that's native. This comes to within about four miles of the California state border, uh, and it's Brahia armada, the blue fan palm, or the he blue Hesper fan palm. Um, slow growing, beautiful, beautiful color and texture, uh, and it can be used in formal or informal situations. Um, those were, that's a grove that I had planted at Rancho Santa Ana. Um, and those are about, in that photo, oh, probably about 10 years old from seed. And they're, um, although they've got short trunks, the, they're way taller than me uh, with their foliage. And again, if you think of gardening in front of those, uh, there are all kinds of interesting things you could do. I had mentioned Santa Lucia fir earlier. Uh, it is one of the world's two most drought tolerant uh, firs, the other one being the Grecian fir. Uh, so it is more drought tolerant than any other fir you could use. Uh, it is fairly rare. It's a rather, um, what, uh, rather unique fir. It's the only one with those long bracts and again sometimes even put in its own section and probably will end up in a different genus at some point I figure. There are a couple of trees I was just going to mention really fast because I have many other things. Uh, again Santa Cruz Island ironwood, great evergreen, wonderful texture, very erect shape. There's also the Santa Catalina form, Floribundus floribundus, uh, which is equally upright, uh, just a bit coarser leaf. Uh, it tends to be lesser seen in gardens. And then a plant that actually is sort of an interesting case. Um, all of our, all box elders have now been lumped into the single species, Acer nagundo. Most of the yellow foliaged forms were all out of variety Californicum. Uh, and this form, Kelly's, Kelly's Gold, was selected in New Zealand, but its germplasm is Californian. Um, and so, again, I do consider it just a selection that was made overseas uh, out of one of our native plants. <laughs> If you're using any golden foliage plants in California gardens, you really have to be thinking about what your backdrop is. If you do have a lot of coast live oaks, very effective. If you have a lot of chaparral plants, very bad idea. Uh, it just looks chlorotic and like there's something wrong with it. If you have rich greens, it works. Vine maple. Uh, at our garden, these are pretty drought tolerant. We almost never water them. Although, again, the Berkeley is a bit different than most places. Uh, at Rancho Santa Ana, we would have to water them. Uh, it does have this beautiful fall color, and it does give you the look and appearance of Japanese maples with a California native plant. Uh, here in Santa Clara Valley area, partial shade or east side of a, of a house is probably best. Red bud. Lots of people like red buds, and I've never been real fond of them myself. Um, I find them too ephemeral. Uh, I like ephemeral plants, but I don't like ephemeral big plants. Uh, and that I love the foliage. I don't like the pods. Many people like the pods. 
Uh, Dave Frost would say he hits them with a badminton racket to <laughs> knock them off. I never tried that, although it's in our book. But the nice thing about Red Bud is that you can coppice it, take it to the ground every so often, and that many of the forms that you see grown as standards, as <laughs> trees, single trunk trees, really aren't Circus occidentalis. There are a lot of other Circus species. Uh, Silicastrum from the Mediterranean, Canadensis from the east, Mexicana from the south, um, and I think many of those single trunk ones really aren't ours. Um, and again, any time you do get a Circus with a large trunk, it usually then just gets slower and slower growing and goes into decline and that uh, again usually in the wild fires come through burn off all the tops everything comes back wonderfully and healthy um, i cut many of ranchos down over the years to rejuvenate them and it really works well again you shouldn't be afraid to experiment with a plant that isn't performing up to your standards whatever they may be. <laughs> um, one, of my, one of my favorite plants from Baja as a small tree, and there are many plants you can grow as small trees, is Fraxinus perii. It used to be Fraxinus trifoliata. There was just a problem with that name, was applied to a Chinese tree, so it had to be changed. Uh, the best forms of it are these tall columnar sorts. Uh, and so it gives you kind of the look and feel of Fraxinus dipetala, but with a taller, narrower shape, which I, which I find most gardens want something tall and narrow rather than big and spreading. Uh, those are the seed pods with a few flowers in there. There's some white flowers there, but most of those are the seed pods very drought tolerant. Bladder nut, oh, and, and those seeds don't come up. Um, certainly never did in our garden at Rancho, and I didn't see very many in the wild either. Uh, bladder nut from the Southern Sierra is another very interesting plant that should be grown more. Many people like Styrax, and this just kind of has a look and a feel of a bit more delicate Styrax. Uh, they can get to be up to about 10 feet or so, usually very narrow, oftentimes not really full and dense. And then you do get these nice clusters of white flowers and then these unusual seed pods. They're not fleshy, they're just filled with air. Um, there's usually three seeds in them. And it doesn't need that much water either. You can see how that one, from a design perspective, uh, dark background, all this pale green foliage and the white flowers jump out at you. Manzanitas. There are so many nice manzanitas, and some of you have heard me speak on manzanitas. I can talk on manzanitas for hours. This one is Regis Montana, which is one of our local species right here. It's actually the Kings Mountain manzanita from Kings Mountain Road right here in, uh, in Woodside, uh, going up to Skyline Boulevard. Uh, it is one of the big tree-type ones, a uh, large, large plant, but beautiful sculptural. Uh, nature to it. And this is actually Carol Bornstein's old garden with Lewis Edmonds manzanita, which is one of the widespread, very easily grown, larger, but not too out of scale manzanitas for most small gardens. Uh, nice pink flowers, gray green leaves, and the sort of purplish stems. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, easily grown manzanita. And Howard McMinn, uh, which is the ubiquitous manzanita, the one you can see or used to see a lot more of along Sand Hill Drive and at Stanford Shopping Center uh, in the islands and in the medians. 
Uh, it is one that can be clipped as a hedge because it grows very slowly and incrementally, although the more you clip it, the less flowers you'll get. And it is the one that oftentimes when I talk about it, it's one that Saratoga Hort introduced. Originally, the Sunset Western Garden Book said three feet tall. And then <laughs> 10 years later, it was up to four feet. And 10 years later, five to six feet. And then I think they just sort of gave up because they can get up to about eight uh, with age. And that is the size of that one in the image there. Uh, it is one of the easiest, most adaptable manzanitas to almost any use, as is this one, Sunset. Uh, Sunset was also a Saratoga hort plant. It's actually a, a natural hybrid between uh, Hookeri and Pajaroensis uh, that was found in the wild. It doesn't flower particularly heavily. What it is known for is sort of bright new growth and that it lives. Uh, <laughs> it's one that nobody was really thrilled when it got introduced, but it got used in a lot of landscapes because Saratoga Hort grew lots of them. And so that was during the 70s. Then uh, people noticed when they came back 10 years later to look at some of those native plant gardens, this was always alive. And so then it had gone out of the nursery trade, and then when people realized how easy it was to grow, it came back. And it's still widely available now. It does not have smooth red bark. It is one of those big ones, big blob manzanitas that you can use in a uh, hedgerow or as an informal uh, screen. It's excellent for those sorts of purposes. One of my favorite ones is one of Roger Raish's. Uh, this is Myrtle Wolf, a Pajaroensis selection. He originally thought it was a dwarf form because uh, it is sort of miniaturized leaves, but it does get bigger. Uh, the biggest ones I've seen have been up around here, which compared to Paradise, which can get up to 10 feet, is much, much smaller. Uh, but it is one of the richest pink manzanitas out there and easy to grow. We could grow it at Rancho as, and people up here can grow it well too. Um, ground cover manzanitas, actually in the Bay Area, many of these are, are actually good ideas. Uh, Radiant was actually one of Emily Brown's plants from Hillsboro. Point Reyes is from Point Reyes. Emerald Carpet was actually from Haven's Neck. Hearst Manzanita, actually I have 10 minutes so I'm going to fly through a bunch of stuff. This is the last of the Manzanitas. I love Roos, uh, but many of you probably don't know this one, Roos Lentii. It will take heat and drought much better than both Sugarbush and Lemonade Berry, and it has more attractive flowers. However, my favorite of all of them is Sugarbush still. When you're talking about hedges, this is one of those Merica hedges. I don't tend to like uniform hedges of one material. I like the idea of mixing them up, even if you're going to clip it. Um, if many of you know, oh, what's the name of that garden? Oh, well, I'm not going to think of it. Uh, Major Johnston in England, Hidcote. Uh, yes, many of the hedges there are, are clipped formal hedges of different plants growing together. And that if you think about putting Baccarus for the lower piece and then Mirica above and then clipping, it actually works. I also am very, very fond of Mahonias, or Berberus, the native ones. Uh, not only are they excellent structure plants, like manzanitas, they're permanent. They've got great foliage and lots of, lots of flowers, lots of berries for a lot of different wildlife. And actually, Nevin's Barberry is one that you can eat and enjoy, not just tolerate. 
many of these other ones, you can eat them, but you won't enjoy them. <laughs> Golden Abundance, a very good, again, large, large um, informal hedge uh, screen plant. And again, if you notice, many of these plants are branched all the way to the ground. All of your ground nesting birds and stuff need to have this sort of cover in order to get by. Um, many, many of our native California birds are ground nesters, and if you are too urban and have too many cats, that's why you don't have those birds. Uh, Compacta is an outstanding ground cover. This was a planting that was going to be removed and they cut it all off and then it all came back so nicely they decided not to remove it. Uh, and again, that's one of those things. If the plant is old and it's not performing, just cut it off and see if it will come back. Many times they will. Creeping Barberry, again, very good low growing ground cover sort. We talked about some Ribes earlier. Uh, my favorites are the Malvasiums because they're the first to come into bloom. Uh, they always, they and Arctostaphylos refugioensis are, are always my key to the new year of plant growth. Are they earlier than Arium? Yes, Arium is usually much later. Uh, we all know these and that. There's Golden Current. Golden Current does frequently in this area get rust real bad. Uh, the more interior you are, the happier it generally is. Ceanothus, of course, great plants. And again, you'll see a lot of these go to the ground and do provide a lot of habitat for small mammals as well as birds and innumerable insects. Uh, Concha, one of the best. Uh, blue Cascades, also a very nice paler blue. This is actually one I collected in Baja. And then Diamond Heights. Again, that, that foliage is not the easiest to work with. And then if you do have a lot of Ceanothus, you probably will have these and just not know. Um, at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden, now we've had uh, or found uh, cocoons in a number of our Ceanothus, and we've seen them. That was actually a female, and then she was out there putting out pheromones for two days before a male came. They don't even have mouth parts to feed. Uh, they're only to breed and lay eggs and die. Malacothamnus edgewood, another local selection for here uh, from Edgewood Park. Uh, probably the nicest of all of the native mallows for gardens. It does not run underground making big thickets. Um, Chiranto formantia, formanodendron decumbens, monkey flowers, woolly blue curls, salvias. Many of you may know there's the third international salvia summit being held by our garden and Berkeley Botanic Garden. Uh, second weekend in October up at Tilden. Um, it's all online. Uh, Salvia apiana, beautiful plant. A lot of people, in some writings, you see that people say it doesn't do well in the Bay Area. It does just fine. Put it in full sun. Aromas, Winifred, Betsy. Betsy's a chimera, so you get individual flowers that can be split horizontally, vertically, or you just get single color white ones in amongst the blue. Carl Nielsen, one of my favorites, a uh, hybrid between um, Mojavensis and Clevelandii. And one of the biggest surprises is Salvia Chiana peplica, or Chiana peplica, from Baja, California. Um, I had always thought that this was slow growing here, but this is it at our garden up in Tilden. And it has the biggest individual flowers of all of our uh, Californian sages, uh, and bloomed for us for about 
what, four months this spring. Uh, very easy. And that, what you were seeing there, is full grown. They don't get any bigger than that. They're usually about here. And that's without any pruning. Salvia munzii. You have upright forms, cascading forms. Hummingbird sage, there are also yellow ones, pink ones, amber colored ones. Yellow sages, actually. Wanted to get to buckwheats and probably end right after this. Uh, we've already heard buckwheats are great plants for innumerable insects and small birds. Um, eating the seeds, uh, using the plants as cover, uh, all sorts of plants or all sorts of insects use the flowers. Uh, again, those flower heads go on for months and months. Um, Giganteum can get to be about eight feet or more in height. Uh, Blissianum is the natural hybrid between it and arborescence. Cedros, or the one, um, Ariagnum male from Cedros Island can be, um, or it's also one of the allies to Giganteum and Arborescence. It can get to be about this high. One of our local species, Juan Buckwheat, this is actually up at Betsy Klepsch's garden where she has masses of them. And again, it's, it's very useful for creating a lot of interesting landscape effects. And it flowers over a very long season and always this nice silver color. You also have the beautiful yellows of Shasta sulfur and those perfect hemispheres. Again, all buckwheats tend to be brittle. If it gets damaged by a dog, uh, the newspaper being delivered, whatever, uh, it's oftentimes best to just start with a new one. Latifolium, incredible uh, for butterflies and bees. Crocatum, uh, Grande Rubescens, Arborescens, Zauschnerias, I still like to call them Zauschnerias, even though they're all epilobiums. And that just gives you sort of the two extremes from um, Route 66, which is a big one, up to about here and naturally branches so it holds together when it's in bloom uh, to some of the septentrionalis sorts which are only a few inches in height with the real gray foliage. We do have native junipers. They do provide some good cover for small birds um, and they, when they fruit, of course, the, the cones are eaten. But the other thing that never gets enough attention are our Asteraceae. Um, and that in all of the talks I talked about, well, there's always this sort of lull as you get later in the year with nothing in bloom. It's because that's when all of our comps are in bloom, all of our Asteraceae flower. And there are innumerable ones, and most of them just aren't grown. Uh, some of them are spectacular, like uh, this Guadalupe Island Senecio, Senecio palmeri. This is it up at our botanic garden. Those individual flowers are about this big, and in big heads like that with that white foliage, it doesn't get better than that. This was the plant from hell that people have talked about, uh, Aster chilensis, uh, or now Symphiotrichium chilensi. This is Carol Bornstein's selection, Purple Haze. Again, it's a wonderful plant for, for insect habitat. Butterflies, bees, uh, a lot of beneficials. But if you want something that's less rambunctious, we have lots of nice uh, erigerons, many colors. So I think I will just end there. Um, thank you, and sorry to have gone on a bit. And if you do want any of these, please do.